Yo, what's good, peeps? How's everyone doing today? Welcome back to episode four of the Drew 313 podcast. And today we got a special guest, and this is also the first time on YouTube we will be doing the cams. But uh, welcome, Everything King, to the podcast. How you doing today, man? I'm doing good, man. I'm glad that you uh, invited me. Thanks for having me on. I haven't I haven't had one of these on YouTube in quite a minute, but it's a special occasion, so you have to bust out the Drew Weisers for the <laughs> night. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. So I've I've asked everyone about this. We're going to jump right into it about how they got started on YouTube. And so far, everyone else that I've had on again, I've only had a handful of people I've talked to so far. Pretty much everyone has said that they've found you first and then they were inspired by you, which we'll talk about that more in a second. But how did everything King come to be this YouTube guy who at times, man, you beat 97.1 when they uploaded stuff out there. So, I mean, you had this big momentum coming in when you first started out. I mean, when I found you, you were talking about the Lions, and that's how I found you. And you only had a thousand or two thousand, but you were already established. So, I don't know if too many people know this, but how'd you get started on here? Man, you know, um, to be honest, it was around the time where Andre Drummond, um, you know, Andre Drummond got drafted, and um, you know, it, it inspired me and made me wanted to start search on searching on uh, YouTube and you know, on radio to, to hear about my Pistons, Max, I was excited about it. And, you know, when I, when I went in there and, and I searched for Pistons and Lions um, at that time, it really wasn't nobody out there, you know, that was uh, doing more than about a thousand subscribers or that was doing, you know, videos consistently. So mm -hmm. first people I seen was uh 313 Hitman and, um, and he shouted me out after I did my first free agency video. So I thought that was everything, you know, coming into this thing. When you you hear your name on YouTube, you think of something, you know, huge. Yeah. So, um, you know, him and Man Beast were pretty much the only people I've seen on YouTube. So I said, you know what? It's it's a shame that we don't have a, a community, you know, and listening to 97.1 back in the day, you know, it's the same as it is now. It was horrible. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and pull this camera up and try it. I was at a park walking around doing my workout and I said, let's talk about free agency. So I did the first video and I actually had got a hundred views and I thought that was amazing, <laughs> you know, yep. walking into it. So, yep. um, you know, it inspired me and, and it made me want to, you know, keep going because like I said, I just want a community for Detroit sports. I want a platform for Detroit sports and, um, that was the whole reason I started this thing. You know, I started out in my garage, um, in the very next video, sitting on a, a van seat, you know, in my mm -hmm. garage, talking pistons, man, drinking a brew and, you know, fresh off work with suspenders on with a back. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I started literally from the very bottom, man. And, um, you know, on the way up, I got an opportunity to meet a, a lot of, you know, good people, man. And, um, you know, you had 313 J-Mo. He came out of he came out of nowhere. And, um, you know, I ran into There Goes Mobby back in the day. And like I said, you know, when I started to see everybody else started to come on, you know, it made me even more encouraged because that's what I wanted. You know what I'm saying? And then when you was talking about you going to do a YouTube, that was that was a good thing right there. Because like I said, for the Pistons, you, you have a lot of Lions content creators, mm -hmm. but for the Pistons, it wasn't it wasn't that many of us. So, you know, I'm like, man, you know, I, I really want these dudes to do this because it's going to help me. I'm trying to build some type of army here you know what I'm right. saying? and build it because they trash us so much on TV. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't watch ESPN, NBA TV. They just talk trash about us. And, um, you know, that's what that's what started it, man. Like I said, I, I just wanted to, to put, put some Detroit content out there that just wasn't there at the time. I, I think it's safe to say you are one of the founding fathers of the Detroit sports YouTube community. And now you've seen everyone doing it on social media, on Twitter, and there's Instagram pages. I mean, everywhere you go, someone's got a Detroit sports community. You go on Patreon. There's, I mean, anywhere you go, you can find it now. And I think that you helped establish that community. It's one of the people, one of the people things don't know is that you go out of your way with some of these newer channels, someone who just <laughs> uploaded the first time, and you go in there and you comment. So then people see everything King supports them and they get a couple of subscribers from them. So, I mean, what is it that makes you do that? Because you don't have to do that. I mean, sometimes, you know, people get over that 5,000 mark and they change. They don't want to help anyone. It's all about me, 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 me. But you're one of the realest people in the community. I mean, like you don't 
beef with anybody. You try to help everybody out. You're on everybody's shows. I mean, what what is that responsibility like for you? And why why are you just such a good guy and trying to help people get established out there? You know, I got to give a shout out to my moms and my pops, man. You know, they just raised me like that. You know, I grew up in a, a neighborhood, you know, me and three other brothers. Um, it was four of us and half the neighborhood. You know, my, my mom, my dad, they raised multiple boys in my neighborhood. And one thing that they always put in my mind was to, you know, uh, be to be together, build something, build something with people. And when I see somebody starting out like I was, you know, I want to give them that opportunity that I didn't have where I could have uh, some YouTuber that has a, a bigger platform to say, hey, you know, check out this guy. Go check out his video or a comment in his, or get a comment in my video when I first started out. Um, mm -hmm. And like I say, even though 313 Hitman wasn't a huge, the most huge guy at the time, um, you know, it did a lot for me. It inspired me to keep doing it. So, you know, I'm always a person that's just going to, you know, like I said, all the drama and stuff is not necessary, uh, especially we all love these teams. Right. And like I said, half the time, these teams don't even realize that we exist. So, you know, for us to be arguing and fighting and all the drama and hating, we had, a, for example, you had a guy that I, I, um, I started out and you don't even hear from him now. I don't know if you remember him, uh, Slam Dunk Comedy. Mm hmm. Yeah. I literally helped him get the uh the page going, man. We was I was uh messaging him back and forth and getting it going. And as soon as he got an opportunity, he, he dipped right out of here. <laughs> you know yeah. So, you know, like I said, I, um to, to drop in, drop comments on guys. I watch so much, I watch YouTube. I don't watch regular TV, you know. I watch YouTube. I watch YouTube to me is TV. So you know, um, when there's nothing else to do, I'm scrolling. I type in Detroit Pistons. I scroll through and, and see who's new out there and drop a comment, man. You know, like I said, it, it's it no matter how many subscribers you got. I'm still a regular dude. You know what I'm saying? We, we just like to talk about our teams, man. So when I'm out in public, you know, um, and I have an opportunity to meet people, and they meet me, they be like, man, this dude is just like really a regular dude. And I am. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Nothing special. Just a subscriber count on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? So even if I was um, some big time person, I still would be the same. I'm always going to be humble, man, because that's where I started from. So, you know, that's why I do it, man. It's kind of it's kind of weird. People view us like that, though, because literally last week, I just told Noam about this in the last episode. I was going to get a pop out of the vending machine. And the guy who was refilling the vending machine knew who I was. He's like, I just met a celebrity. I'm like, well, no, no, you didn't. <laughs> I'm, it I'm never get old, bro. Eat the it fire job old. right now, man. I ain't made it. Come on, man. <laughs> it never get old, man. We work regular jobs. We do all the regular stuff. Everybody, I just came from grocery shopping, um, you know what I'm saying, and door dashing. You know, it's not, we're not some type of celebrities. We just, we just got YouTube channels and we yeah. like talking sports, man. That's real. You know? Simple and plain. Yeah, man. The real life. It's always cool to me. I mean, I met a couple of people now, and now it's getting to the point where, like, in Flint, my my city is like people know me now in Flint. This is kind of kind of crazy to think about. Like, yeah, hey, man. But it's cool, man. I like meeting all the people, man. Yeah, it it never gets old, man. And then to have somebody. It, the the funniest part though is when somebody say, "Hey, man, can I?" take a picture with you and then people get to looking at you like who is this dude yeah right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's it's weird man because i'm like a really shy dude and all these people yeah. they just come up to me out of nowhere and i'm like hey what's going on yeah man I'm, I'm yeah super it's goofy cool. it's cool though it's cool it never gets old man nah. so let's let's talk the pistons here we're, we're two games into the preseason one and one got blown out by the grizzlies Cade probably not gonna play uh, for the entire of the preseason, Killian. I mean, this is gonna be uploaded tomorrow. He's not scheduled to play tonight. But what are you looking to see from the rest of these guys? I know you're a big uh, Garza guy, and I know his dad Frank is really supportive of you, which is awesome. Congrats on that. That's really cool to see all the time. But uh, so, what are you looking to see from the Pistons for the rest of the preseason, getting ready for the regular season? Because it's a different year. We're not tanking. Yeah. Playoffs are gonna be tough. Plan term is gonna be tough, but. We're going to be one of those teams fighting for that spot. So the mentality's changed. What are you looking to see from the rest of the guys, the rest of the preseason? All I want to see for the preseason is I just want to see them guys clean it up, man. I want to see some consistent, solid play. You know, after the last game was so terrible. I mean, good Lord, it was horrible. 
and you know i cut down these turnovers get you know used to playing with each other out there because like i said we still got some new guys out there olenic trey lyles and you know so we we gotta like i'm just looking for the jail i just want to jail with this team and it's kind of frustrating because your two starting point guard, your two starting guards are out right um you know but like i said I, you know i'm loving what i'm seeing from sadiq bay i'm loving that i want to see isaiah stewart uh you know be a little bit more in control in those um, file situations um you know but like i said it's not really much we can do um we don't have a another solid big man to put with Stu because like i said sometimes Stu is just he's just outmatched by mm-hmm. size you know ben wallace was undersized too but ben wallace was a little bit more athletic than sue i mean i said good lord i said Stu. <laughs> <laughs> Stu. um so you know, like I said, I just want to see them come out, play some solid defense, play together, uh, and clean it up a bit. Clean mm-hmm. it up and try to do a, you know, a community rebounding out there. <laughs> is everybody's gonna have to rebound? Everybody's gonna have to rebound. He, you know, Stu needs help. Everybody needs to rebound. He said himself that he took it personal when um, he was interviewed by Rye Beard. Um, so, you know, he can't do it all alone. We need more rebounding. You know, Olenek, we lose some things from Plumlee that Olenek doesn't do. Um, Olenek is not a guy that's going to grab you a a good 10 rebounds, you know what I'm saying, consistently. That's just not what he's going to do. So, you know, until until we can get another guy down there, or if, if, hopefully, if Garza can continue to show some improvement, um, we just going to struggle in the paint. You know, like I said, Garza is not athletic himself. So, you know, and and like I said, he's dropped some weight. You know, in this league, you know, we got some big centers. We mm-hmm. got some really big centers, man. And uh, we need some help. We definitely need some help down there in the paint. Need some big man. So, um, but for the preseason, that's all I want to see. I want to see them and clean it up a bit and, and be a little bit more consistent. Uh, you know, get some get some time together, get some reps together, and and get a little bit better. I think once Cade and Killing come back for sure, uh, healthy, they'll help with the rebounding. They're actually pretty good rebounding guards. They'll get about – they average about six boards a game in college or so from around the ballparks. I mean, that'll help out. But at the end of the day, I think you're right. Kelly's not a great rebounder. He's here to be the offensive juggernaut off the bench and go get buckets. So everyone else is going to need to step up. Uh, Diallo and Josh Jackson, something they're not particularly great at are going to have to learn how to box out and get those boards. Because if they get it, they can push it in transition. It could be a lot of fun to watch. But with that second unit, if you can't get any stops and get the board, you can't get those second opportunities in the fast break. So it's going to be interesting. But I, I think what the Pistons will do is they'll have Killian and Kate out there at all times. One will be playing, one will be resting up. So that way we have a floor general. So hopefully we'll see a lot more fast breaks this off season, or I'm sorry, this regular season. And get some highlight plays, man. It feels like the last year there wasn't too many highlights. And every every other year, man, you know, you would have a Dre alley oop or a half court shot, or I can't believe I'm going to praise him on the on the podcast, but a Blake Griffin dunk before <laughs> his knee went to hell again. We haven't had any highlights, man. We got we got to get some here with Cade. Well, Dwayne Casey said that they want to play fast this year, you know. So we might as well, man. The oldest yeah. player on the team's what? Corey Joseph, no, McGriddle. Yeah, oh, those guys, they, they don't matter. They're barely going to play. Well, so it, wanna, it, it's kind of amazing. It's kind of amazing that he said he wanted to get out on the break and play a little bit faster, man. You got rid of, you know, one of the young kids that actually played well during the fast break. Uh, so, and you brought Trey Lyles, who was horrible when, in fast breaks and horrible in rebounding. And you know, I'm so done with. I'm. I'm. I haven't even started with Lyles, and I'm done with him already. It's, <laughs> it's just boring. You know what I'm saying? It's just boring, man. Yeah, I didn't really understand that sign. Everyone was hyping it up, and I'm just like, eh. Uh-uh. No, no. He fits to be a spur. He has that boring spur game. Not for this team. This team is supposed to be feisty, nasty. He does not fit whatsoever. So, you know, hey, it is what it is. I'm just glad that, um, you know, we'll we'll have another opportunity to bring some talent in here. And we have some money to spend. Um, so, you know, we'll get help. We are, we're on the way. Like I said, don't want to rush nothing, but we're on the way. So speaking of fit, there's a there's a potential rumor out there. And <laughs> vaulting a guy similar to Blake Griffin, they both dated the same chick. Uh, the man from down under, Ben Simmons, we all know the situation there. 
pretty much didn't want to go to Philly. Now he's coming back to Philly for some reason. But there's a report the Pistons are potentially interested in moving Jeremy Grant for this guy. I'm not buying this story, man. It's BS. You don't it – your first year as a GM, you brought in Grant to be your guy, okay? You Grant wanted to come here to be with Troy, to be this guy's leader of this team. You're not going to trade him year number two to Ben Simmons, a guy who can't shoot the ball and quit on his team. So uh, I, I got a feeling you have a similar take on that. But what's your whole mindset with this crazy Twitter world right now? First of all, it's all BS. <laughs> and the little – Rumors that's out there are all BS. Um, if any, if any time that Ben Simmons get moved, it'd probably be closer around December. But um, you know, this thing with Ben Simmons, to me, it will pr- it will bring uh, absolute clog uh, a log jam here uh, with this team. You know, it, he doesn't fit the way that this team is built. You know, like I said, he he will have to have the ball in his hands, which I absolutely will not like at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not trading Killian because I've seen him in the package. I'm not trading Killian to bring a high pay guy in here who virtually just passes and rebounds. I'm going to keep the young guy and develop him mm-hmm. knowing that he has an actual chance to develop a jump shot. Ben Simmons has been here. The jump shot is just not coming. It's not coming, you know? So, uh, to have him with here with the ball in his hand, I like spacing. I like spacing. I like, you know, guys that, that can confidently take a shot. Uh, we're trying to build that with Killian. So, like I said, I'm not trying to bring another bad contract in here. We're just about to get money. Why would we do that? And right. why would you trade him for Jeremy Grant? Jeremy Grant has one of the best contracts in the league. You know, like I said, his contract is absolute steal right now. So why would you do that? That, that to me, would be you pressing. You're pressing the tire too much. That would be, you know, I mean, come on. I would, that would be my first strike against Troy if he did something like that. I, I'd probably to say it would be my sh- – I don't know if I gave him a strike for Seku or not, but it, it was pretty close yeah. to getting yeah, that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but with, with this, is like what have we been wanting in the Pistons? We wanted a guy who could come in and get buckets, embrace the city, embrace the team, and actually want to be here. And that's what we got in Jeremy Grant. And if you flip-flopped him just – and Ben Simmons should have no one else – it's not a good fit for Philly because they already have Tobias Harris. They're going to play the same position. You're going to have him come off the bench with Drummond? Okay. I mean, that's that's pretty all right. But he's not going to want to be a starting number one option, going to be a seventh or eight option over there. Right. And then if you put Ben Simmons over here, how long until he quits because Cade's the guy and not him? Right. So I don't think on either side it's, it's a good trade. I just think it's a slow day in the media. They need something to yeah, talk about. Yeah, got to have something to talk about. I know it. NBA Central is one of the Twitter outlets that was putting it out there, it, but it's absolute baloney. I always um, got to double-check them. They're, they're really clickbait. Yeah, yeah, they are. It, the, the, the report they put out earlier was absolute baloney. Um, and even the guy that they um, referenced in the tweet was baloney. So, yeah, it, it's like I said, it's a situation that we don't, we don't, we just don't need nothing like that. You know, you got Kay Cunningham, um, you know, floor general already six foot seven, to be honest, not six foot eight, but, um, you know, nice size, you know, has all the abilities. Why bring in Ben Simmons, you know, someone who's, I don't care if he's an all star or whatever. No, not for this team. Any other team, Ben Simmons has the type of game where he needs to go and play with another star, another mm-hmm. star guard. That's where he needs to go. Somewhere is another star. He needs to go go to shit, go to hell. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just don't come here. <laughs> no, nah, but I'm just playing, man. Um, just don't want him here. Just don't want him here. So what's your what's your viewpoint on the playing tournament? Obviously, all the Pistons need to do is be the 10th seed to have a shot to make the playoffs. It's very doable. However, the East stacked up. A lot of these teams that made the playoffs last year got better, and teams like Chicago, who missed out, got a lot better. Do you think the Pistons have a shot to make the 10th seed? Absolutely. Absolutely, because I have zero faith that um, all of these teams that are looking good on paper right now, that they're going to uh, be – you know, special and they're going to stay healthy. Um, a lot of these teams don't have the depth. Um, so, you know, you're about a good injury or two away from some disaster. Um, and with that said, you know, like the Pistons, we have, we have about a good 10, 10, 11 guys that's solid. <laughs> so, right. 
I, I can definitely see the uh, Pistons uh, catching some type of momentum. If if we can stay fairly healthy, we can catch some type of momentum and, and get there. You know, like I said, is yeah, they look great on paper, but you know, every single year there's a a disappointing team or two, and there's going to be a lot of trades <laughs> once these teams, these fr- these franchises figure out, hey, we're not about to win the championship or we're not going here. It's going to be a lot of trades, uh, yep. you know, mid season. So we'll see. I think I don't want to say it's going to be the level of the Hawks, but I think once the Pistons get that chemistry to that midpoint of the season, they can rally up some W's pretty quick because this team could be dangerous. I think this team is one of those teams where like it could be a trap game. Like you see the Pistons on the schedule, Brooklyn comes into town, we can we can win. Boston comes in town, we can win. So I think teams are not looking forward to playing us, but right now we're unproven. Like teams don't know what to expect, especially since they've seen Cade play what two, three summer league games, and that's been it. So, I mean, yeah. we're kind of disguising what we got there. And so far, what I've seen in the preseason is the offense looks pretty much the same. Jeremy Grant gets a lot of looks. Uh, Sadiq's getting a lot of clean looks, and he's working on uh, scoring inside the arc with that mid-range fade and attacking the paint. If these guys continue to get better, if if Stu and Killian and Sadiq can improve midseason the way they did last year, I mean, watch out, man. The Pistons could be a scary second half of the year team. And really yes. try to get those doubles to fight for uh, playoff position. And, and we got, like I said, we got some time. Um, to we we definitely got time to continue building. And oh yeah, you know, oh yeah. Pistons, they are right now. The Pistons are a Rasheed Wallace away from being serious. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we having the same issues that the Pistons had before we went and got Rasheed. You know, um, we need a Rasheed to Isaiah Stewart's Ben Wallace. Mm-hmm. That's what we need. And, um, you know, like I said, you got some some potential power forwards coming in these uh, upcoming drafts. So, you know, like I said, if you'll be able to tell right away what's the game plan for this season, if the Pistons plan on being high in the draft again or um, if they're really going to try to be competitive and get into at least that play in position, Um, they can say a lot. But this is only year two. You know, it's fast, but it's only year two. So. Um, we still need that solid guy at power forward. We need that guy at power forward because Jeremy Grant is not a power forward. This is, it don't matter how much we try to make him one. He's just not – he's not a power forward. Um, he can play it in a small ball situation, but full-time, no. So, we'll see, man. We can, we'll can see we'll see what the Pistons uh, decide to do this season. But I truly do believe that they have an opportunity to, to get in that play in position. And, you know, who knows? It could be a Rasheed Wallace situation where – you know, trade deadline comes, you know, we're kind of where we want to be in terms of competing. We might be a little bit more aggressive on the deadline and get that missing piece instead of selling and getting draft picks. So, yeah. I mean, it's really kind of crazy. We don't know what's going to happen this year. I mean, it can go any direction. You know, if you're keeping up with the MCU, there's all these different timelines going on right now. That's kind of what it feels like right now with the Pistons, man. We don't know what's happening. And somehow we got three Troy Weavers acting up right now, so. It's it's been crazy, but it's probably been one of the most fun off seasons for involving the Pistons yeah. in quite some time. I mean, even if we don't make the playoffs, it's not the end. I'll be all, I won't be upset, and none of the people watching this show right now should be upset if we don't because no. we're establishing something. Uh, what you want to do is give the young guys confidence. So, Cade needs to get some looks. He needs to be, kind of be a primary offensive playmaker or scorer. Mm-hmm. But you got to really work on the whole Killian Hayes and him building that chemistry up because I think they can work and they can be scary. Uh, Cade and Killian, if they can get those shots down a little bit more uh, efficiently, uh, Cade, not so much, man. He looked like he's going to be a pretty efficient scorer right now. Oh, yeah, he he can shoot that boy. He's looking more aggressive. I mean, he's not always hitting them, but he's pulling up and he's being more assertive with the shot. So confidence is key for shooters, man. If he gets some confidence, sky's the limit for him. But I'm probably – I don't know over K, but I'm probably more excited to see uh, Sadiq Bay out of the guys from last year. Yeah, man, Sadiq is my guy. I, he's my pick for the most improved Piston this year. Um, you know, watching yeah. him, you know, live at practice, some of the stuff he was doing at the practice, man. Uh, the dribble, the dribbling, and the attacking the basket, man. I was super excited to watch him because I know Sadiq Bay is, you know, ever since. The draft, he's just been this underdog for no apparent reason. I just don't understand yeah. why people just look at him and toss him to the side. I just don't get it. So, um, you know, he's going to be that player where teams, you know, they look at us and they they see him and they, you know, it's a surprise. Like, wow. You know what I'm saying? 
Uh, we knew the boy can shoot, but now he's attacking the basket. He's drawing fouls. And, uh, you know, that that can create a, a total problem because, like I said, we got two rookies at guard, you know, and I call Killian Hayes a rookie, obviously, because he haven't he hasn't played. Really. Right. So um, and he came into the league without the summer league and the training camps and all of that. So, you know, technically two rookies right now at the guard spot. So as far as, um, you know, second year vets, him. Yeah, he's my guy. He's my most improved piston, either him or Josh. I want to see Josh do it consistently, though, but Josh has been cooking people. And um, if Josh can do that consistently, that's all that's been his problem the whole time. You know, he'll have good Josh games, and then he'll have the bad Josh games. Mm -hmm. More consistency from him um, will definitely make him a possibility for a, a six man type of guy. Yeah, man, I, I think with with Sadiq is like I'm, I, probably the most exciting thing about year two is seeing what Harmy's going to do. Year number one, he already folded the Mavs organization and the coach quit. The front office was a mess because they didn't draft him. <laughs> Can't wait for year two to see who's falling apart because of him. Um, yeah. But I'm really pulling for Josh Jackson. Yeah, he, he's the home hometown hero. Yeah, but there's just the swagger and like. He doesn't back down from anybody. And again, we can't have Ben Simmons here because you know you're <laughs> talking that talk with him last year. But if we can throw a lineup of Killian, Diallo, and Josh Jackson, you can run a full court press. That's a scary defensive lineup. Detroit Pistons basketball. The simple and plain is that he fits it. He, he's versatile. And I think if he didn't get hurt last year, he would have had a little bit better of a season because he was in rhythm and timing and stuff. And it's good for him to get these preseason reps. And I, I think he's gonna get off to a strong start to the year like he did last year. Most definitely, man. Like I say, it's I, like I said, Sadiq Bay is just the the fact that we got him where we got him, and then the fact we got you know guy like Garza where we got him, you know, it just speaks to Troy Weaver's eye to figure out talent, you know, Thank and that's why, I, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and that's why I have absolute faith in what he decides for this team because and no one's talking about Livers either, no, which no, no, he's like exactly. a perfect Robin for Cade. To be honest, I believe that Livers is the reason why we got a Sekou casualty, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly believe that um, Livers does uh, pretty much everything. You know what I'm saying? He, he the, the attitude, he can shoot, he can go to the basket, he can play defense. He does some of everything. So, you know, it's a, it's a guy that a lot of people are, you know, uh, kind of forgetting about, you know, because we haven't had an opportunity to see him. But – you know, having, you know, Jawan Howard and and John B lying around, you know, it's going to do nothing but help all yep. of those guys. It's going to do nothing but help. And I believe, you know, I got to give B line that credit to helping Killian be a little bit more aggressive, because when I was at the open practice, he he definitely was a little bit more aggressive. He did these. He, he gave a series of moves, then drove to the basket. And he just missed it because it was contested, man. But the crowd was buzzing. Because they never seen that was the most aggressive move I've ever seen from Killian since he's been here. And, you know, like I said, I want to see more. I need to see more of that, you know, attack. I don't care if you miss right now. Be aggressive. Be a fit out there. You're not you're not going to miss everything. The right. only way that you're going to, you know, build some confidence is if you actually go out there and do it. So, you know, I can't wait until regular season. Because I got so much, so much on him and uh, Kay Cunningham just being this dynamic duo, man, in the backcourt. Every Detroit Pistons team that we had that was successful had that duo. Yep. And I want them to to be that. You know, we had those big guys, those them nasty big guys down there that we had uh, big guys that can stretch the floor. Rasheed can stretch the floor. Bill Lambeer can stretch the floor, but at the same time, they were nasty down there. Yep. So we definitely got to go and get that um that counterpart for Isaiah Stewart. But that that backcourt, that 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 two, that duo right there is what I want to see be successful because it's gonna make everybody else better. Instantly. I absolutely agree. I've been preaching that, preaching that, preaching that. Yeah. But you know, some of these some of these people that come in and watching this team now, watching our videos are, are new Pistons fans. They don't understand the history and the culture. I mean, Grant Hill was one of the faces of the franchise. Like, he could have been the next MJ. He could have been a Sports Illustrated left and right. They would talk about him on ESPN every night. And it never panned out because they never got a good point guard or technically a big, big man to help him out either. But watching him and Jerry Stackhouse was fun to watch. But 
they didn't they didn't compete the way they needed to on the roster scale. So they traded him for Big Ben, got Chauncey and Rip, and everything was off and rolling. So very, very similar to what's happening right now. And people are comparing Cade to being our Chauncey and Killian being our Rip, which is kind of crazy since, you know, Rip can shoot right off the Rip. No, That's kind of like his nickname, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> right. you got to develop him, but the Pistons have put emphasis on development. We got that assistant coach from Boston who got credited for developing Marcus Smart. Jalen mm-hmm. Brown and Tatum. You got Beeline, who, you know, one of the best coaches in U of M basketball history. You got Jawan Howard coming in the building, and now you hire Big Ben to come in and teach Beef Stew and hopefully help Kelly Olenek learn how to play defense a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. to help Kelly with there, but really a mentor stew. So the Pistons are putting all the eggs in one basket in development. Complete night and day difference from what we've seen from the last, what, 15 years or so. So Troy knows what he's doing, man. He's, yeah. he's, he's getting his flowers right now. Yeah, it's the way you build a franchise. You know, um, one thing and that a lot of people, especially the young crowd that don't want to uh, accept the fact that, you know, you need to take your time when you're building the roster correctly. Um, a lot of them, you know, they they believe everything's like NBA 2K where you can just flip things over in two years and then be yeah. competing for championship. It don't yeah. work that way. Yeah. Um, even some, one of the greatest teams we ever seen assemble, it took them a while to build and that's golden state, you know, golden state actually went out and drafted those guys, which they don't get enough credit for. And they developed those guys. Um, you know, the early injuries when, when Curry first got there, you know, the growing pains with Draymond Green and, you know, all of that, they built that. And and that's what I want the Pistons to do. Take your time and build something that's going to sustain us for a long period of time. I don't want nothing quick and flashy. I want something that's going to have some longevity. So um, I like I, I absolutely love the way that they're going about it. So let's let's switch organizations here and go from this sunny, upbeat optimistic future Cade's the savior to what the hell am I watching that quarterback with the lions? It's, it's kind of weird right now because this fan base is really torn. Uh, you have the people who are, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid still like golf just needs more weapons. You got to give Holmes and Campbell more time on the other side is fire Campbell, get golf out of here and burn it all to the ground, which is not a whole lot to burn down to the ground. Everyone else is pretty much gone. Right, They're just terrible. Right. Right. I'm kind of like in the in the line in the middle. I, I'm giving Holmes and Campbell time. I like what they've done. I like what Holmes did in the draft and Campbell's speeches, man. They get me fired up, right? Yeah. If Jared Goff wears the Beverly Hills cot coat one more time, I'm gonna give him the five finger discount, bro. <laughs> that is so disrespectful to Eddie Murphy for him to be wearing that coat. I just <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand how you can have guys like Cephas and TJ Hawkinson. He, you don't throw the ball more than five yards down the field. Oh, I really man. don't. Plus, we know with Swift and Williams, you can actually run the ball now. This is the best I've seen the Lions run the ball as a team since Reggie Bush and, and jo- Joy Bell were in here. It's, it's just like, what the hell is going on? And then we can't stop people in the last 30 seconds of a game. They have to hit a field goal. What is your whole thought process on what's going on with the Lions right now? I mean, I know they're the Lions, but what the hell? Drew. <laughs> you know, you know, going back to the beginning of this pod, you know, I, when I came <laughs> in, I loved what I did. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right now, the Lions are so much of a drag to cover right now. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, like I said, we knew about the rebuild, and that actually inspired uh, me to. Uh, drop the content that I did this year, and I'm still inspired by it. But it's the boneheaded things that just it just it's a drag. You know, you know, you don't have anything on this roster, really. You know, people like me that watch football, we already knew about Jared Goff. This is yep. you know, nothing's new that Jared Goff is doing. And you got the this this percentage of the fan base that just have had they have no clue about Jared Goff. Mm-hmm. So they're arguing with you, trying to tell you, oh, he's not that bad and this, that, and he just needs a team. Do you not realize what he just left? He just right. left a team with one of the better defenses. He just left a team that had premier running backs on that team with him. He just left a team where it's probably one of the best coaches in the NFL. So what makes you think he's going to come here to the Detroit Lions 
and just change everything up. Once you go and get this guy and that guy, he already has Hawkinson, Swift, Williams. He already have these guys on his offense, and he he's not even utilizing them half yep. the time. What makes you think something's going to change? He's a bridge quarterback, and for some reason, the Detroit Lions fan base just won't let him be that. They won't let him be that bridge quarterback to just be here until we go out and draft our guy. Um, you know, but for Dan Campbell, I have no problem with Dan Campbell, man. Uh, Dan Campbell makes me want to play. He yeah. honestly <laughs> makes me want to, you know, he, I start thinking about all of my old, you know, football days, man, just listening and watching him because I had a coach that was similar like him. Um, you know, and it's not just a rah rah thing, he is producing the best that you can offer out of this skeleton roster. You know, you, you go up and down the roster and count how many injuries we have, you're going to get lost because it's that many guys out right now. And mm-hmm. we have, what, three to four guys out for the season, you know, that are pivotal players, that are star players on this team. You know, Ragnall's a pro bowler. Taylor Decker is a fringe pro, pro bowler, you know. So uh, we drafted Okuda third overall, and he's out. For the whole year, Aquara left. He led us in sacks, and he's out for the whole year. So it's like you know, with the expectations for this team, um, I just think the fan base needs to lower those expectations and and re you know go back and re embrace the rebuild process. You know, we're going to be picking top three in this draft. Um, I know it's painful to watch. You know, especially lose by a field goal twice. Um, you know, but those were winnable games. And that's that's that that's what has me kind of pissed off right now. Those were winnable games. And it's the simple fact that both of those games, you have a quarterback that gave you zero points in the entire first half. And you end up losing by a field goal. Mm-hmm. If he goes and throws one touchdown, we're having a different conversation. We're at least two and three right now or whatever the record is right now. But um. You know, that's my biggest thing. I have no complaints with the coaching staff because they don't have the talent right now. Um, it's just Jared Goff. I just I it is it, it's, it's a stench and I can't get it off of me. <laughs> you know, I, it's yeah. the Jared Goff stench, man. So and it's not like I say it's not personal, uh, you know, it's not like I hate him as a person. I don't hate him at all. I just I just didn't want to take that type of contract you know, and have him around here for two years and you slow down the process of actually retooling this team. You know, we had an opportunity to get Teddy Bridgewater and the Lions didn't go for that. They just wanted to, you know, cater to Matthew Stafford. I love Stafford, but I would have told Stafford, listen, we're taking Teddy Bridgewater. And if you don't want to go, then you're going to be the quarterback here, whether you like it or not, until you accept something that we want. Mm -hmm. So they did it with all the other players. I don't know why they got so nice with Stafford all of a sudden. Um, but yeah, I would, I would rather have Teddy Bridgewater on a, a much cheaper contract. And actually I believe he's a little bit more talented than Jared Goff. Um, obviously. So yeah, that's, that's what has me. It's a drag. That's what has me pissed as a Lions fan right now. Where do you, where do you stand with the Matthew Stafford situation? Because the fan base is split there, you know, uh, people are calling us out <laughs> easy, on, um, you know, if you root for the Rams on Sunday, you're not a real Lions fan. So, well, well, like, people are people are tripping out. Okay, Staff, we we watched Stafford for ten years. We watched him grow up. Okay, yeah, I'm happy for Stafford. He we, he went to the same situation. Golf was at. He's yeah. thriving. He's top five in passing yards. They've lost one game. They're looking like the team that they can compete with Tampa right now. Right. Right, and on top of that, kicked Tampa's, Tampa's ass. Kicked, oh. kicked it and walked it dry. <laughs> Tom Brady. Uh, walk, walk. Yeah, and you know, the, here's the thing with Stafford is we've been through so much trauma, you know, here in the city, and it's a part of the fan base that just have to f- point a finger at something. Mm-hmm. And Matthew Stafford's been that guy. And one thing here in Detroit, once you know, any athlete on any one of our teams put a bad taste in. Uh, the fan base's mouth they have a hard time letting things go yep and they don't want to let it go with stafford they want him to fail so bad they just hate everything stafford they hate to hear his name and uh you know you know shout out to easy but easy's been a a matthew stafford hater for a while so (laughs) i expect nothing different from (laughs) easy but um you know 
I'm happy for Matthew Stafford, you know, to come here and to to have some of those uh, performances through injury, you know, to be tough and to want to go out there and not say, forget it. We just uh, with the Lions, we suck. I'm going to go out here with a, a dislocated this or a broken that. And I'm still going to go out here and try to win this game because I love this team and I love the fan base. And, you know, the fan base, they just gloss over that um, and they automatically go, oh, well, we we never beat nobody this, this and that. Well, listen, one thing you got to understand, a lot of the fans just seem to forget you countless times that we've been screwed over. Um, and we see the clips, you know, people always talk about them in memory. Those were pivotal games. Those were pivotal games. Those were not. Those were not just some regular old games we got screwed in. Those were pivotal games we got screwed. The Calvin Johnson rule, the Seahawks game, you know what I'm saying. So it, it's the Cowboys game most of all. Even Calvin Johnson brung that up That's during the interview with the Hall of Fame. Yeah. So you know they know what was going on. The problem with the fan base is not realizing who the real problem is. Right. And that's the Fords. You know, they bring people in here until recent. They bring people in here that don't have a clue about anything. And, you know, it destroys it destroys everything. You you bring in you have Jim Caldwell um, that take you to the playoffs and give you a winning record multiple times just because he made a couple of bad decisions in the fan base's eyesight. They wanted him out of here. Well, listen, man, if Caldwell was granted the actual talent that say per se, a uh, Jim Schwartz had in 2014, yeah. we'll be talking about a different story here. Yeah. Those rosters that he had and still took you there. You being the lions, the most losing his franchise Ever and ever, <laughs> yep. you get bougie and say, "Oh, well, nine and seven is not good enough." Y'all believe Bob Quinn when he walked in here with that Patriot bullshit, and, and you know he brings Matt Patricia in here. Everybody, I want Matt Patricia just because he was from the Patriots, not paying attention. This is the difference between a football a person who watches football and a Detroit Lions fan that's just you know just out there. We all know about the Belichick factory and how bad the coaches that come out of that factory are. Yep. For some reason, the fans thought that Matt Patricia was going to break the mold. He turned out to be one of the worst out of all of them. He was a rocket scientist, dude. Yes. Right. Right. He's, he's, smart. So smart. he's a rocket scientist. Oh, he keeps a pencil in his ear. Oh, <laughs> oh, Matt Patricia. He absolutely destroyed this team. Yep. Destroyed, ran away so much talent, you know. So it's like I kind of don't feel bad for the Lions fan base no more. Yeah. I don't because you bring your, out. yeah, you bring your you bring everything to your own demise, man. You bring the bad vibes here, you know. You put the negativity out, there. you know. Some of the stuff that you know they root for and some of the stuff they hate is just ridiculous. Yeah. So I don't feel bad for them no more. And I tell them straight up how it is now. And like I said, even with, when I make content now about the Lions, it don't. It's not the same like it used to be. You know, the the clicks get less, the likes get less. But I don't care. I'm going to be the guy that's going to hold you in the cell and make you go through withdrawals and get off the hopium. That's just me. That's me for now on. If they don't like it, I just oh tough titty. Yeah, <laughs> tough <much>. titty. <laughs> tough titty. So that's funny. Yeah. I mean, hey, ain't nothing I can do, man. It's like I say, if you're not you're not paying attention to your franchise and how bad they've been in the decision making they've done over the years, you know, and how little they've done to contribute to really winning something here. And you get up and you you dress up and you spend all this money on these season tickets and you you you're a cash cow to them. That's what you are. And they don't take you serious. Because if they took you serious, they will actually do some things in here that will propel this team to winning. So it is you what know, it is. It, it's it's kind of funny that at one point in time, Caldwell was one of the most hated people in Detroit. Everyone wanted him out of here. And now he's one of the most missed people in Detroit. And after watching the football life of Calvin Johnson, just seeing how the players in the locker room looked up to him, like he was an idol. He was a movement 
uh, rather if it was for the racial uh, being a black head coach, a lot of like Calvin Johnson looked up to him and respect him for that. Like, that's that's huge. You have to take those into account. And it wasn't like we were three and thirteen or yeah. four and twelve. We weren't getting the job done. We were nine and seven. We were competitive. Injuries, bad play calls, and they were quick to boot him out. Even know? even when eleven and five for you, when eleven and five for you with that roster, you know what I'm saying. And we end up getting screwed, but. We went 11 to 5, dude. And that wasn't even with his team. That was with Jim Swartz's team. Right. It's like, come on. Like, what the hell? You know, and it, the reason why the, the players continue to call out Jim Caldwell, number one, he gave you something that the Detroit Lions just not, they have not had except for probably like three times. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Not, <laughs> yeah not, not you just hope. He gave you, a, they gave you a, co- a culture. Yep. They gave you a culture, you know, even Jim Schwartz gave you a culture. We had a nastiness, a toughness, you know, with that, with, with the Jim Schwartz era. Um, he brought you a culture. Yep. You kind of see that being built right now with Dan Campbell, um, you know, just the way the players are responding. But um, he brought you culture, number one. Number two, he brought you some wins with what he had available. They'd be like, oh, you did. Well, they didn't beat any good teams because we didn't have the good players to beat exactly. those good teams. At that point, we yeah, we had uh, Matthew Stafford and Calvin Johnson. But when a defense is giving up all of those points, it's like, what the hell are we really even talking about? Right. You know, I can go on some of those rosters, man, and and name some people on those defenses. And people don't want even they won't even remember them. Right. <laughs> so it's like, come on. You know what I'm saying? You have to – I always say on in order to win in this league, you have to be at least good on defense. And in order to do that, you have to have at least one good guy at every level. One good guy on the D-line, one good guy in, in, in uh, your linebacker group, and one good guy somewhere in your secondary. Yep. And that's just something that we just cannot do. We could not stay healthy on defense to save our life. Yep. Ziggy Ansa, oh, my God, I don't even <laughs> on. You know what I'm saying? Man. It's like, bro, you know what I'm saying? And after 2014, we all seen what happened with Fairley, you know, right. health issues and all it just it's it's man. <laughs> I can well, go on all day talking about that. Crap. Let, let, let's get you out of the dark, dark cloud oh. here because uh, we got the pisses game here in a little bit. So we'll, we'll go ahead and try to wrap it up. All right. One of the things that has really impressed me, which I, I don't know if it was your secret talent, you just hid from the world is your is your cooking. When you post all these pictures on, on Twitter, dude, like my mouth starts to water and like my stomach starts to rumble, and like I, I can smell it through my phone. Where did you learn to cook like that? And why is that such a big a part of like just a hobby? Or where, where did that all come from? I, I got to give partial credit to uh, my mom, but at the same time, it's just a, it's a, it's just been a gift since I was young, man. You know, I could, I had a gift to watch somebody else make something. And then go immediately make it and put my own twist on things. Mm. I, it's, it's always it's a it's a soothing spot for me. It's a it's that you know sitting at the waterfall and and meditating type of thing. <laughs> it is mind soothing for me. So um, me, I'll go on YouTube and and pull up something that I'm thinking about making and, and watch a few videos and go in the kitchen and do it. You know, it, it's just. Some people can just do that. They can just look at something, then go do it. And that's just one thing I can do with cooking. Um, and I absolutely love to cook and barbecue, big time barbecuer. You know, so that's uh, one of my secret things that, you know, I love. And, you know, I, I am going to be putting more of that content on my other channel, too, um, so people can get some of these recipes because I do it too often. I'm getting ready to go in there and make some crunch wrap Supremes right now. <laughs> oh, oh. Just, that's what i say i just left the, the grocery store i went to myers to pick up the shells and the soft uh tortillas man and i'm getting ready to go make some of those right now uh for my kids and my wife man that's so. way better than what i'm having <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's I crazy i absolutely love cooking. i wish i could cook like that man i i, I the best i do is I, I told you this off of one of the video or uh, live stream early in the year is like i can make a mean di giorno like yeah. I'll, I'll take any di giorno you want yeah. but i put extra spices on it i make homemade garlic butter yeah. i'll parmesan like it, it's phenomenal right but like yeah. that's my excess like it's a half-ass cooking job right 
I'm pretty good with breakfast food, but like big dinners and stuff. Like if I make chicken, I don't cook it all the way through. Mm. And at the end of the day, I mean, you look at my skin color, dude. It's salt and pepper. That's all I got, man. Look, That's all you I want, got. <laughs> you want to know? You want to know the, the the secret to cooking chicken? The secret to knowing when you know it's done all the way is when it's floating. It's when it's floating. When the chicken start floating, um, it depends on what you're cooking in. I'll say that. I'm cooking in a deep fryer. My chicken starts to float, and I can move it around a little bit. I know it's done through and through uh, because once it's cooked all the way, it releases that weight and it floats to the top. You know, I do the same thing with fries, you know, even just looking at the color. If they start to float, you know, they're done. You know, they're done. So my mom's taught me that. <laughs> hmm. But breakfast is actually my my favorite thing to cook. I cook huge breakfasts. One day I, I cooked a breakfast for one of my friends. I cooked um you know, sausage, eggs, grits, pancakes, fried some chicken, made toast. Like I just went nuts one day, man. I love breakfast, man. That's one of my favorite things yep. to make. So yeah, I, I can feel that. I definitely can feel that. I, I I I'll do this. I can make some pretty mean breakfast. I don't know if it's to your level or not, but I got that from my grandma. Like she makes everything homemade. Yeah. And for some reason, like even her like. Her peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, like they hit different because they're made with like pure love or something. Like it's, it's something like it's like peanut butter and jelly. Like, how the hell did you do that? But it's like it's phenomenal. So like every every Saturday, I would spend the night over there and we watch like cartoons and stuff. And she'd make waffles, pancakes, English muffin, sausage, yeah. bacon, like hash browns, oh, eggs. You're like, it's just me. Like why are you making all this food? But it's something that stuck with me. Now I can I can make a pretty mean waffle and pancake and yeah. all this yeah. other stuff. Uh, one thing I want to ask you before we get out of here is families looks like it's very important to you as, as well as it should be. I'm starting to find that out now that I'm starting my own family, but you've brought your family onto YouTube. Now you got two different channels you're a part of now. Uh, the newest one is W three Kings, which I believe that's your cousins, correct? No, those are actually my brothers. Oh, those are your brothers. Okay. So yeah. I didn't know well, that. So now, look, when I say brothers, your brothers I'm, on now. Okay. Yeah, when I say brothers, I mean this, remember what I was telling you, you know, my, uh, my dad and my mom raised half the neighborhood. They're not my blood brothers, but we've known each other since we were pretty much walking around in, right. you know, Superman underwear. So, you know, those are we we call each other brothers. We don't call each other friends. We actually are because all of our parents was all connected together. We all oh, literally cool. grew up together in each other's houses. So you got you got that going on. You got your other YouTube channel where it's mostly you and your wife of the yeah. royal family. Yeah. What what's that kind of been like now that you got family friends involved and. You're really starting to expand. So now you don't have to talk about the Lions every week when they get blown out or it's a stressful week. You can talk about just your your life. So what's that kind of been like? And how's that journey going? Well, you know, it's actually one of the biggest things that I want to do. Um, you know, sports is a plus for me. You know, it's it's a hobby. It's a thing that I love. Um, and I love just to be a fan of. But always number one is family with me. You know, just family oriented the way I, that I was brought up um, and to have my family to get on there. I just want people to see what it's like on a day to day basis. And I want people to do better, you know, better with their families, because I know a lot of family or, you know, broken up families growing up, um, especially growing up in a poverty neighborhood like I did. You know, you just don't see that family camaraderie like you do um, on, a, on a regular. So, you know, being able to say, hey. You know, and like I said, not to make this thing about race, but usually when a lot of uh, people see, you know, young black men, they usually say, you know, is he a father to his kids or, um, you know, is he in the home or, you know, even when you're trying to apply for something, the first thing they ask is the father in the home and things like that. I want to be able to show and say, hey, I'm a father and a husband. And I want to show people to do things the right way, you know, do to be the best person that you can. That and and that that inspires me the most out of anything is to be because you look at a year ago, right now, this time, a year ago in October, I didn't even know if I was gonna be alive, mm -hmm. you know, when I had to take my absence away from YouTube. So um it just elevated things even more to have an opportunity to be able to speak and be able to cherish my family and be able to share my family and any type of knowledge that I can give anybody else to help them along the way. So it just inspire you more. Like I said, none of us, we ain't none of us. We ain't no angels. You know, we all have our, our flaws, but 
while I got an opportunity and a platform, I'm going to try to put the most positive perception out there that I can. So that's why I do it. Well, that's, that's beautiful, man. You got a, you got a beautiful family, man. I'm, I'm like, it's always cool to see that because this is like, they're, they're a unit, man. You yeah. guys are like the A team over there. So yeah. uh, let me ask you one more question. I hear the baby crying right now. So I got to go take care of that. <laughs> but I have to, I have to ask every guest that comes on the show now because someone requested it. It's been a pretty cool topic. Top five rappers of all time. Everything Kings, top five rappers all time. They don't have to be in order. I am the biggest Tupac fan that you ever find in your life. Um, yeah, I cried when he died. Yeah, that's well. how that's how serious it was. Um, so Tupac, Biggie, Nas, Jada Kiss. Um, and I'm probably gonna have to go and, and see. It's kind of hard to do because it's a group. Yeah, but I'm a Wu Tang fan. You know what I'm saying? I'm a big Wu-Tang fan. I know y'all be seeing the tweets on, on Twitter. You know what I'm saying? So yep. I will have to go with that as my top five, man. That's yeah. my top five. And, you know, that's one of the things you really can't argue because it's so people are influenced by music different ways. So, I mean, like people are more influenced by Jay-Z from what he says because it's what they grew up with. Or you're a Tupac or Biggie guy if you live on the east or the west coast. I mean, it's really kind of cool to see different people's takes. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. It's just... It's interesting to me, and I think people really get a big kick out of it. So, yeah. yeah. Well, man, I gotta, I gotta hurry up and take care of this baby because I can. Hear it, you know, <laughs> yeah. My old lady will kill me if I don't hurry it up. So, I mean, I appreciate you coming on the show, and I don't want to feel like it's rushed. So, if you ever want to come back on, just let me know. We'll get you back on. But right. what do you got to plug for the peeps, man? Where can they find you at on social media? Plug your other channels so they can check it over there because I watched that. I watched that uh, live stream on uh, uh, W three the other night, and that was a pretty good show, man. Yeah, we um well first and foremost, if you want to find me, it's everything king on pretty much every outlet except Instagram. On Instagram is I am uh I am king un is I am I underscore am king seventy seven on Instagram, but everything else is everything king. Um as far as my new podcast channel, it's uh, you know, it's we three kings, it's spelt W three and then Kings with a Z at the end. Um we just started up on Spotify. We on I, we on iHeartRadio. We're on Apple Music. Um, what that channel is is sports, life, and family. So we'll be talking sports and doing picks, but at the same time, we're going to talk topics. We're going to talk family. We're going to talk real life. We have a, a, a really special episode coming up, and we're going to talk about someone or one of the most controversial people right now on uh, social media. Man, uh, social media. And his name is Kevin Samuels. So we're getting ready to do that episode and it's going to get intense because some of his views, um, it directly affects me, my wife and uh, some of my brother's um, households. So look forward to that and check us out, man. Absolutely, man. I uh, appreciate you guys listening today. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're not already, go subscribe to Everything King. Go subscribe to the uh, We Kings podcast on YouTube and Apple Music and Spotify. And also check out his other channel, The Royal Family, as they do everything over there as well. With that being said, I appreciate you guys watching. If you're on Spotify, whatever it is on Spotify, like and subscribe what it is over there. I still don't know. It's the fourth episode. And I still don't know that world yet. So whatever that equivalent is over on Spotify, please do it. And uh, we'll catch you in the next one. And that's the bottom line because Double D said so. Peace. <laughs> Peace.